What does an obscure 19th century novel have to do with 21st century Senate hearings? In fact, I propose that the Gothic novel has an important lesson to teach us today about how we treat men in power and women's stories. Start by trying to imagine with me that you're a 19th century teenager, and after the death of your father, you have to choose which relative you want to live with, a kind and loving aunt or your father's brother, a reclusive, impoverished man you've never met, the suspect in a murder inquiry, who gets all of your money if you die before you turn 21? Well, if you're Maude Ruthen, heroine of Uncle Silas, of course you choose the uncle, because that was your dead father's wish, and you've been taught to trust male authority even when that contradicts your own judgment. In the novels that I study, Gothic novels, young women are threatened and controlled and dismissed by men who should protect them, but who care instead about protecting their own power. Silas dismisses Maud's fears even as he plots her murder. And importantly, the girls in these stories are motherless. They don't have women in their lives to share their stories and to teach them the potential dangers of the patriarchal system that men hold power, and though they say they use that power to protect women, some will often do the opposite. These novels still resonate with us today because just like the Gothic villains, our culture continues to endanger women by dismissing their stories. Because you're told as a woman that if a man hurts you, then somehow, because of something that you did or didn't do, say or wear, it's your fault. Because if as a woman you stand in front of your country and tell your story, many will choose instead to believe the man in power. Because to face the alternative is terrifying, that many in power care not about women's experiences, but about holding on to that power. So Gothic novels are important today because they teach us to recognize that the systems which purport to protect us often do the opposite. And they teach us how to fight those systems by women sharing their stories with each other and with the world. Thank you. I want to start off with a quick show of hands. How many of you would be willing to donate, say, a dollar to the Lexington Cancer Society? Please? All right, keep those hands up because we're going to be collecting these donations now. No, wait, wait, wait. What just happened? A minute ago, a couple of seconds ago, you were willing to make a donation because I asked you a hypothetical question. But then when this question became potentially consequential, you had to change your heart. This is hypothetical bias. Why does this matter? This matters because a lot of the business decisions, a lot of the policy decisions, a lot of these decisions that impact our daily lives, they are based on surveys, on focus groups, on questions that had no consequences whatsoever to the people who answered them. And as we just saw a couple of seconds ago, this can be very dangerous. So what are we doing? What we're doing is that we're trying to mitigate, to reduce hypothetical bias. To do that, we invite people to complete a series of math problems. To no surprise, when we're paying people for the solutions of those math problems, we get a better performance than when we're not paying them. However, and this is where it gets interesting, whether we pay for a third, two thirds, or all of the math problems, we get the same performance levels. Furthermore, our participants were completing these math problems in front of an eye tracker. An eye tracker is a device, an infrared device, bless you, that measures, amongst other things, pupil dilations. Pupil dilations are very good indicators of engagement and truth-telling. And once again, whether we paid for a third, two-thirds, or all of the math problems, we find no differences in the dilation of the pupils in the participants. So what does this mean? This means that our participants, as long as they perceived even a portion of their choices as having consequences, they treated everything as real. What does this imply in practice? This implies that no, we have not found the silver bullet, but we may have uncovered a path 
to getting real answers to real questions through consequences. Thank you all very much. Hello there. Did you know that dairy calves are commonly removed away from the cow so that we can make her tame around people? But as a consequence, up to 20% of all calves are sick within the first two months of life. They get respiratory disease, gastrointestinal problems, and this is a real challenge for dairy farmers as farms continue to grow in size. We're having a really hard time finding these sick calves. And that is exactly why I'm the sick calf detector. You might wonder what that means. Well, essentially, I'm taking a bunch of technology. Raise your hand if you know someone with a Fitbit and you know what it is. Exactly. See the technology in this room? Something as simple as an accelerometer, which measures whether you get up, how you're walking, can be used on a calf as well. You see on my slide here that little yellow guy? That's an activity monitor. And we can use that to track how the calf walks, how often she gets up. We can use things like the robot that we feed the calf with to see how much she's drinking, how much milk she had, when she visited. You might be wondering why on God's earth that matters. Well again, remember, 20% of all calves are sick when they're on milk, and we need to find them as farms get bigger. So why not use the same technology that you all have available to see if calves are sick? We can use things like the scale to weigh the calf to see if she's sick. We can use a thermometer. We all know when you're sick, you have a fever, right? Well, what if you get a slight raise in temperature three days before you're sick? We all know three days before we're sick, right? We start to feel kind of terrible, lay around more. That's where my Fitbit comes in, remember? So all of these different technologies, even an ultrasound I can use on the lungs. Everyone's seen somebody that's been pregnant and they see that cute little baby in there. We can actually find ammonia in a very similar way looking at the lung. What if all this technology can find a sick calf? And that's where this PhD comes in. I take all of this technology I'm collecting on these calves and I put it in a fancy math equation that a computer does for me. Think of all the equations you experience that Netflix knows what shows you wanna watch. That's a fancy equation, fancy math. I can do the same thing with technology to find which calves are sick and then tell a farmer with an alarm, as seen here, look at beautiful Mocha on the corner here. Yes, her name is Mocha. She is so healthy and gorgeous, right? What if I were to tell you she's sick? She has an injury, and thanks to an alert system from my research, we found her and got her right back on track. Never knew she took a step back. And that's why I'm the sick calf detector. Thank you, everyone.